from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Kerry Ebert joins us to talk about the main themes being promoted during this National Farm Safety and Health Week all of which are illustrated, she says, in a series of webinars that can be downloaded for you farm families and other groups to view. Also today, K-State's Casey Olson provides updated information on the effectiveness of a late summer pasture burn on Ceresia lespediza. He has just completed his four-year trial of this approach to Ceresia control. And on this week's K-State Horticulture segment later on, Raymond Cloyd reports a noticeable absence of oak leaf itch mites so far this season. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to Agriculture Today. And this is designated National Farm Safety and Health Week across the country. It is an annual occasion to, well, frankly, remind ourselves about the hazardous nature of agricultural activities and the things we need to keep well in mind to stay out of harm's way on the farm or ranch. We have by once again Research and Extension Farm Safety Specialist out of K-State, Kerry Ebert. The theme of this week is putting farm safety into practice. Kerry, what does that signify to you? Well, the theme this year is a little different than it has been in the past where the national theme has been some specific aspect of farming. Um, Well, I think we've in the past talked about roadway safety or child safety on the farm. This year, it's more of a recognition that all of us in agriculture, we understand that we're in a dangerous occupation. I, you know, I don't think that there's anyone out there who, who could look you in the eye and say that farming is not dangerous. And so the theme this year is acknowledging that danger and then just to remember what those safety protocols are. And of course, we designate the third week in September, National Farm Safety Week, because this is when typically we see the busiest I guess the most activity happening on the farm where we have harvesting going on, we've got planting going on, we're tilling, we're still haying. Mm -hmm. And so there are safety practices that we need to implement, you know, safety P's and Q's that we need to mind when we're so busy. And that's when it gets to be really difficult to not take the shortcut or to, you know, to do that one task that we know we shouldn't do without doing something else first. So, you know, in the push to get crops planted, get crops harvested, you know, sometimes safety takes a back seat. And so this is just a week that that we kind of set aside to remind everybody. And then hopefully that carries through the rest of the, you know, we're still kind of early in this fall season, carries through to the rest of the year, because certainly we want farm safety to be top of mind all year long. So this year, the national folks have uh, decided to designate topics for each day of the week. And so... And their primary considerations, which we see routinely on farm. Exactly. And so instead of focusing on one area, we're focusing on all of them and just taking each day to look at them. For example, we've got tractor safety. Obviously, that's that's the big one. Tractors are the cause of more fatal accidents uh, on the farm than any other piece of machinery that we use. So certainly that's a topic we need to keep top of mind. But also farmer health, our own health, chronic issues. I mean, it can be a, a, a chronic illness, you know, like cancer or heart disease or diabetes that affects our ability to farm. It could also be an acute or chronic condition like arthritis or uh, severe pain. We do have to maintain our health to be able to farm safely. 
And so that's a focus that we often, it's certainly something we, we tend to overlook, especially when things get busy, like we, we forget about, you know, we don't pay as much attention to nutrition and hydration and skin cancer, you know, covering up our heads, our bald heads. <laughs> to keep, um, you know, that, so farmer health is, covers a whole lot of, of topics. Children and youth on farms, their health and safety. Um, certainly we've got a lot of, you know, airborne particulates and lots of exposures on the farm, health issue wise. But we've also got, you know, certainly safety issues of where do children play on the farm and we make sure we keep them safe and know where they're at all the time. And the no extra riders on equipment unless there's a buddy seat with a seat belt available for the young person. But certainly children need to be a focus um, of farm safety all throughout the year. And ATVs. ATVs continue to be a source of quite a number of injuries and fatalities on and off the farm. Farmers use those ATVs for everything. I mean, they're better than a horse sometimes. (laughs) But we do need to be mindful of how dangerous those machines can be. And the other focus for this year kind of ties back into the health issue, but it's respiratory illness. And that has to do with all of the different exposures that our respiratory system has on the farm. As I mentioned earlier, air particulates, certainly there's a lot of dust and dander and mold. And during harvest, you know, anybody who's harvest milo understands, (laughs) understands air quality issues. Um, So it doesn't have to do so much with pollution, but respiratory conditions are very prevalent among farmers. And so that's that's an area that they, the the folks who plan the week um, at the National Center for Ag Safety decided they needed to single out. So yeah, we're looking at, we're looking at everything. It's the whole system here this year. And day by day at the local level, there will hopefully be activities or uh, recognition at the very least of these very topics. Local FFA chapters, for instance, might have something going on to recognize uh, Farm Safety and Health Week and uh, bring out specific points under each of those banners. Exactly, exactly. Um, And the AgriSafe program, that's a national program. They're based in Iowa, but it is a national farm safety program has organized a series of webinars every day during the week from noon to one. So, you know, stop and take a lunch break. And each day has a a different theme. But I also understand that those webinars will be archived so that people can go back and watch them at their leisure. At the uh, AgriSafe website? At the AgriSafe website. And it's A-G-R-I-S-A-F-E, AgriSafe, all one word, dot org, I believe. So that's something that if you want to sit down, I know I do get calls regularly from from folks who want to do, you know, maybe just a little bit of safety training at home, you know, with their family or with their employees, nothing, you know, real too studious kind of thing. But you you can cover a lot of safety issues in a fairly non-threatening way. And so that would be one way of putting out a safety message um, or helping pass on a safety message, just sit down and watch one of those webinars guaranteed to be 60 minutes or less of your time and can lead to to a lot of good discussion about the causes. And then certainly there are a tremendous number of resources also at the AgriSafe website. Time well spent. And why is this all so important? Carrie, when we have you over each time to talk of this wide topic, you bring statistics with you to reinforce the importance of safe practices. And our track record, unfortunately, it's rather steady, isn't it? It is. It is very steady. And again, this year, I'm not happy to report that agriculture is, again, the most dangerous occupation in the United States. The um, death rate is 22.8 deaths per 100,000 workers. And when you combine all the labor sectors, this this is data from the Department of Labor, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. When you combine all labor sectors, the death rate is 3.4. So we're nearly seven times higher than when you combine all the labor sectors Hmm. together. Wow. So when you um, take this, you know, unsafe profession and you move it across all 50 states – 
And you, you think about, you know, the few fatalities. We've had nine fatal accidents uh, that we know of this year in Kansas. These uh, fatalities happen, you know, one at a time, but they do kind of start to add up. And so um, those numbers are actually, that's the highest death rate that we've had in agriculture in seven years. So I'm, you know, I'm not sure if it's just, you know, sometimes these things cycle, but we certainly do you know, want to take this week out to remind everybody about safety and then impress upon everyone to take that safety message on through the fall and winter and into next spring when we start this whole process over again and to just do everything that you can to be safe out there on the farm. These are just fatalities. So certainly the, you know, the injury rate is high too. And while I'm here talking about that, you know, sometimes those chronic illnesses, um, or an acute injury can cause problems for us on the farm. And, and uh, K-State Extension does have an agribility program that works with farmers who have disabilities. Now, those disabilities may not be caused by farming per se, and that's quite all right. The agribility program will work with any farmer. And so, again, that's a K-State Research and Extension program. You can contact your county extension office and get right into that program, but the purpose of agribility is to help folks accommodate any kind of a physical limitation that they have on the farm and uh, modify workspaces, machinery, and tasks to accommodate a limitation. That is a very resourceful program. If you'd like to inquire about agribility, as Carrie says, look into it through your local extension outlet. But in closing here, Carrie, this week is intended to set the tone. It's important for farmers and ranchers to keep the safety and health momentum from there forward throughout the remainder of the calendar year and, of course, far well beyond that. Exactly, exactly. Like I say, we, we pick one week and we highlight all of these issues that cause injury and, and pain on the farm. And then hopefully that, that one week reminder is enough to keep us all thinking safety um, as we go about our work day to day throughout the year. Very good. Always a pleasure to have you over Mike's side. Thank, Thank you, you, Carrie, for joining us once again as we observe National Farm Safety and Health Week 2017 this week here in Kansas and across the country. Carrie Ebert is a research and extension farm safety specialist here at Kansas State University. We'll be back with more after these moments away. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day -day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. We're back now on this Agriculture Today. We spoke not too many weeks ago about this, and we wanted to bring an update to your attention on the concept of controlling the noxious weed, Ceresia lespedeza, in our Kansas grasslands via a late-season pasture burning. This has been an idea perpetuated by research here at K-State and by our guest, Casey Olson, who is an animal scientist at Kansas State University. And Casey, recapping here the approach and things that uh, we're learning as we go, right? Very true. Uh, we're just wrapping up our four-year project. We can make some pretty strong conclusions at this point. Some things that we haven't been able to tell people about up to this point are that this growing season fire really works at controlling Ceresia from two different directions. Uh, Ceresia spreads regionally by transport of seed. And, of course, every year that fire touches a, a Ceresia plant in the August to September interval, it's not going to make seed. The most interesting thing is that over time, the frequency of Ceresia of the live plant has gone down in both of our summer treatments. We started out across the board at about a 3% frequency in all three treatments. We're now up to 8% uh, in our conventional April burn, and we're down about a percent and a half 
uh, a basal frequency in our in both of our summer burn treatments. So less dense, in other words, is less it? dense. And and what that means is that we're we're also controlling the vegetative spread of the plant. Some of our detractors, for lack of a better term, have indicated that this probably wouldn't work because there was so much sericea seed in the soil bank. And what I think that this demonstrates is we are getting some control over what's in the soil bank. You know, fire is known to scarify sericea seed and, and uh, stimulate germination. And what I think may be happening is that we are scarifying sericea seed with these late fires. We're causing it to germinate. But then this little seedling has sprung up, you know, somewhere between 10 and 6 weeks before a hard frost, and we're probably getting winter kill on some of those little plants. We're also seeing western ragweed and uh, Baldwin's ironweed go down in our summer burn treatments. Uh, so we're getting some, uh, some control, not eradication, but control of those plants. Uh, at the same time, we're also seeing this very strong tendency for our functional forbs to increase, to re-express. And these are all the wildflowers that we like to look at that also happen to be legumes or nectar-bearing species that attract insects and wildlife. Our woody stem control is probably best with our August fire as compared to April and, and September. And really excellent control with all three fire regimes on those woody stem plants. So people that are considering moving to a, a late summer burn regime should not be worried that it, it's not going to control brush. Which is a bonus, really, when you think about that. There are things in terms of actually administering the fire that you want people to be aware of. There have been a number of landowners, pasture managers out there who have given this a go this late summer, early fall. They may be noting things that they didn't anticipate, okay. you say, Casey. Well, you know, in a normal circumstance, a growing season fire, of course, is uh, um, more of a challenge to ignite and less of a challenge to control mm -hmm. than would be typical of a spring fire. Plan on using a lot of drip torch fuel. Plan on applying that fuel aerially as opposed to dragging a torch on the ground. Uh, it just seems to work better when that, that burning fuel, torch fuel, gets into the, the fine fuel layer at the soil surface. Ignition takes more time, but like I said, in normal circumstances, it is easier to control. Now, as we move deeper into the fall and more and more people are, are actually, you know, attempting to use this technique, forage is drying out. And fire behavior now is starting to, to look more like a spring burn. Where ignition is easy, control is a little bit more difficult. The appearance, okay, of that pasture ground immediately after the fire is not going to be exactly what you're used to seeing. There will be a lot of standing green material after that fire passes uh, that the fire just simply doesn't clean up. That material, if you go back 48 hours later, will be brown and dead, but it's still going gonna, still gonna to be there. Just encourage people to not be excited about that. It's not a, a blanket clean slate like you see in yeah, the spring bird. It doesn't, doesn't look like a skillet. It's a little rougher looking. The other thing that I would urge caution on for, for folks that are attempting this right now is that we don't have very much growing season left. Okay, in our tests, after our August fire, we had about 10 weeks of growing season remaining. After our September 1st fire, we had about uh, six weeks of growing season remaining. And we would get really nice-looking regrowth post-fire. Right now, as it stands, we're, we're down to you know maybe a month, maybe two weeks uh, remaining of our growing season. Don't expect to see tremendous regrowth and, and maybe uh, use a little bit more caution if you're on a, a soil with a lot of slope to it because water that we get between uh, now and springtime is going to be traveling over soil that's pretty bare and there's potential for some erosion to occur. So be realistic mm -hmm. about uh, what you're going to see. You know, another thing to keep in mind is this is not a one-year treatment. Right. Okay, in the first year, you'll see excellent seed suppression. In the second year, you'll start to see the vigor of the adult plants start to wane a little bit. It's going to take three years before you really see a decrease in the vegetative presence of the plant. But, you know, with, with our research and with people I've been working with for the, for the last three years, that visually satisfying control effect is probably three years away. But your final data, as you say, is in, and it is indicating that the percentage of control, the degree of control, is very favorable. Very favorable. And for your listeners that are used to treating with herbicide, 
it's never something that you can do once and then forget about. You're finding new patches of it every year. You're uh, treating a patch and then having to come back one to three years later and retreat that patch because we just didn't get them all with the herbicide. The really satisfying thing about fire is that where the fire passes, all those bad plants that we've been wrestling with are affected. Fire does not miss much. And with that kind of a comprehensive treatment, I think we can count on adding this to, you know, an existing toolbox of things that uh, provide cerecia control, but maybe with this one, something that's a little more satisfactory and a little more durable over time. Well, this addition to the toolbox has caught a great amount of attention. There have been quite a few producers give it a go this late summer, early fall. For those who haven't but are intrigued by the idea, you would encourage them, Casey, to check into where this has been employed locally or in the region and uh, simply see for themselves what's happened. Absolutely. I mean, if if you're anywhere close to the Flint Hills, I think within an easy drive, you're going to be able to find somebody or some uh, operation that's that's tried it on a limited acreage. Just eyeball it. See what it looks like now. See what it looks like a year from now. Keep coming back. Okay, I, if your listeners are skeptical like I am, just keeping your eyes peeled over time, I think, is going to answer most of the questions. And as a matter of fact, one great venue for seeing this approach fully demonstrated will be coming up this Saturday morning, September the 23rd. In season burning against Ceresia will be the theme of the Wabunsee County Ranch and Range Tour. That will take place just to the east of Manhattan at the Downey Ranch in Wabunsee County. You'll be on the program there, KC, visiting about what we've been discussing today. You can contact the Wabunsee County Extension Office for further information on that ranch and range tour this Saturday. And this is the end of the four-year run for this particular phase of the research. Your hope is that it will extend further and pull in more variables that are very important to this. And where we go from here with our research is how how do we integrate growing season fire into existing production systems? I've got the resources to to investigate the cow calf side of that question, and I intend to begin that next summer. Um, I am trying to get the resources to address the the yearling question. You know, it seems to me that there are intuitive ways to make it work in both circumstances. For example, with uh, with yearlings, it might be as simple as you know deferring fire per normal that we would do in April to a time uh, after the steers have left. Uh, in an and, intensive stocking program, that excellent. might fit. Yeah, that's what I, I was getting at. In a cow-calf system, it may be slightly more complicated, but we've got an idea where we can either defer fire completely until the summer months or come up with a rotating system of spring and summer fires. And I don't, I don't mean to suggest that we would be burning the same land twice in one year, but that, that fire would rotate from one pasture, one environment to another on a yearly or, or uh, every other year, but without excluding watersheds from, from within a, a given pasture. Lots of things welling up as offshoots of this work, and it will be interesting to see it evolve as it goes along. But for the here and now, late summer burning of our native pastures in Kansas, where Ceresia lespedeza has become an invasive problem, is showing to uh, be a good approach to dealing with that noxious weed. Appreciate the update, Casey. Thank, Thank you, you, Eric. Animal scientist Casey Olson of K-State has been deeply involved in this work here at the university. And you can ask him about this approach. You can also inquire at your county extension office about what might be going on locally with respect to August and September burns of pasture for Ceresia control. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here as we continue now with today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. A group challenging the administration of checkoff programs in agriculture has asked USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue for a meeting to make its case for transparency and more federal control of those programs. In a letter to the secretary yesterday, the president of the Organization for Competitive Markets, Mike Weaver, said that group has uncovered a number of issues with the programs. OCM filed a lawsuit back in 2014 demanding the release of some 9,300 hundred pages of documents related to the USDA's Office of the Inspector General investigation into the beef checkoff program. Those documents stem from two OIG audits of the checkoff and its contractors, including the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Now, the OIG's first audit report did find contractors to be in compliance with laws that protect checkoff funds. Then OIG issued a corrected final report that withdrew that finding. Weaver said his group has found additional problems with another checkoff program, that being the dairy checkoff. He says, according to federal law, the program is required to submit an annual report to Congress outlining the expenditures, activities, and effectiveness of the program. This report has not been drafted nor filed for five years, he says. The OCM has requested the release of USDA documents related to a 2012 audit of the beef checkoff as well. Weaver said in the letter that checkoff funds are not producer funds, but in his words, are government funds derived from farmers and ranchers paying a mandatory fee to the government, meaning the USDA, he says, has the responsibility to ensure the checkoff programs are accountable, transparent, and without conflicts of interest. Yet, he goes on to say, the previous administration failed to do so. The group has requested the meeting prior to the USDA turning over administration of the Grain Inspection Packers and Stockyards Administration, or GIPSA, to the Agricultural Marketing Service. Now, the USDA initially conducted an audit of the beef checkoff back in 2013. The OCM filed a request, and the OIG withdrew that audit and re-released it in 2014. The initial audit included a statement saying the National Cattlemen's Beef Association was in full compliance. When that audit was re-released in 2014, the statement was removed. The NCBA has questioned OCM's motives because it receives funding from, among other places, the Humane Society of the United States. The U.S. Meat Export Federation is preparing for its first major marketing events for U.S. beef in China, which recently reopened to U.S. beef after a 13-year absence from the market. The senior vice president for the Asia-Pacific region for the Federation, Joel Haggard, explains that also, although China officially opened to U.S. beef in June, the first sea shipments only recently arrived in the market, and most Chinese buyers have had very little direct exposure to the product so far. To bring qualified Chinese buyers and U.S. exporters together, the Meat Export Federation is conducting a trade show in each of China's three largest cities, Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. Haggard is expecting 300 to 400 buyers at each of those events, with about 20 U.S. companies participating. Deemed the U.S. Beef Roadshow, the Federation is, is conducting this series of events in cooperation with the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service, with funding support from the Nebraska Beef Council. And state pesticide regulators and departments of agriculture are struggling to manage the workload of hundreds of 2017 dicamba injury investigations, as well as looming decisions on how to restrict and manage dicamba use in 2018. The president of the Association of American Pesticide Control Officials, Tony Kofer, uh, he's a pesticide director with the Alabama Department of Agriculture, says if you have a staff of two and you have 150 dicamba complaints, that's not manageable, in his words. Kofer's comments came during a routine meeting of the state FIFRA Issues Research and Evaluation Group that's charged with researching and advising both state and federal regulators on pesticide management and safety. The dicamba injury crisis of 2017 has dominated that group's two-day meeting in Arlington, Virginia. That committee, by the way, will soon make a formal recommendation to the EPA regarding dicamba use in 2018. The EPA has several members in attendance at that meeting. This is Agriculture Today, and on we go now to this week's edition of the Kansas 
soybean update for you. Awaiting with that is Greg Akagi. Greg? Doug Shoup, Southeast Crops and Soil Specialist with Kansas State University, also serves as the chair of the Kansas Soybean Yield and Value Contest. And Doug, the 2017 contest is open for Kansas soybean producers. Kansas is going to have a record soybean acreage planted this year, so it's kind of uh, exciting that we're hitting that milestone in Kansas. We have nine different districts. We have eight geographical regions in Kansas that we split it up, and then we have one category for a statewide irrigation as well, so we do have nine possible districts that you can enter into. We also have a tilled and a no-tilled category as well in each one of those districts. Anybody can enter that's involved in a farming operation. We just need five contiguous acres of soybeans for the yield contest, and that can be either validated through FSA acreage maps, or we ask that you have a witness come observe the harvest and for the value contest it's a separate contest from the yield contest and you don't have to enter both if you want to enter in the value contest all we need is a 20 ounce sample of soybean seeds sent in to the soybean office in Topeka we have the cash prizes for the winners in each district first place gets $300 second place gets $200 and third place gets $100 we also have an overall winner in the state for dry land they get an additional thousand dollars We also give an additional $1,000 to the overall winner and irrigated as well. Still looking for that magical 100 bushels an acre, too? Yes, we are, Greg. Well, I know we've hit it in Kansas. We just need to document it. We are still trying to officially document having 100 bushel per acre yield on the five contiguous acres. You're the first one to do that, and you win the overall high yield across the state. You're going to get an additional $1,000. If they would like to enter, what is the best way they can do that? You need to go to kansassoybean.org. This is a program sponsored by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Association, we're the ones that direct the contest. Look under the Association tab, and there are a drop-down menu that will give you the yield and the quality contest. Click on that, and you can download the form. Make sure you send that form off to us, and make sure it's postmarked back to the soybean office in Topeka by December 1st. That is Doug Shoup, K-State Southeast Crops and Soil Specialist, and also serves as the chair of the 2017 Kansas Soybean Yield and Value Contest on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Agriculture Today is back now, and we're around to time for our weekly K-State horticulture segment. Alongside, once again, is horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension, Raymond Cloyd, to cover what's going on in lawn and garden insect-wise at the moment. And this time of the year, it tends to wind down some with the weather changing, albeit very gradually right now, Raymond. So we have some things to talk about, including, you note, the Absence so far of the oak leaf itch mite, this notorious bug hasn't shown up yet, you say? Well, let's just say, Eric, that the uh, emails and the phone calls and inquiries have been substantially reduced compared to last year. And actually, uh, we got some information from the Horde agents, and they've also seen a a dramatic decline in inquiries regarding the oak leaf itch mite. And uh, I think one of the the reasons is is, uh, walking on campus and looking at my sentinel pin oaks, we don't see the marginal oak leaf gall folder, which, of course, is the food source for the oak leaf itch mite. I haven't even seen very much uh, oak vein pocket gall either. So this is another example of this um, cycling out of insects. Uh, right now, of course, everybody's also seen old painted ladies, which is really interesting. We can talk about that too. But without that gall, the marginal oak leaf gall folder, 
which is a midge, uh, there's no food source for the oak leaf itch mite. So I know people are probably ecstatic right now that <laughs> we're not, they can sit under their oaks, pin oaks, and not get bitten by these uh, things dropping out. So it's really, uh, you know, again, we were making projections that we were seeing. Well, of course, projections are usually wrong. <laughs> and this year has been extremely, I would say, mild. And it is nice to see uh, fewer inquiries, if any, regarding oak leaf itch mite. Any notion at all as to why these galls have not developed? What's happened to change the scene here? Well, that's a good question, Eric. And, of course, we always look at environmental conditions and things like that, tree growth. But, uh, again, it's like uh, any organism, it just cycles out. And this may be a down year for the gall folder, which consequently has resulted in uh, a downside in the oak leaf itch mite populations. So is it... Premature to declare all clear on the oak leaf itch mite? Well, predictions are always, uh, they're usually wrong, I'll say. But right. at this point, unless we start seeing an increase in the oak, uh, the marginal oak leaf gall folder, the presence of the oak leaf itch mite should be actually lower too. Yeah, because they need that, they need that food source. So, crossing fingers here, we may dodge another bullet with this itch mite, which has caused so many folks so much discomfort the last two or three years mm-hmm. in the fall as it's, as you note, uh, drifted down onto landscapes. There are other insects at work. You mentioned the painted ladies. What's the story there? Yes, this has been an absolutely wonderful year of abundance of the uh, painted lady, uh, Venusa cardoa, uh, which is a migratory species. They, they, they're in the southwest. They move up. And uh, there's just been a plethora. They're still out there. There have been inclinations that Hurricane Harvey may have moved them up through the front, moved, moved them some more from the south. But they're out there in droves because uh, sedum and echinacea and salvia are still blooming. And uh, it's, it's, it's just wonderful to see this. I mean, but I think Kansans ought to be aware of this. this is not the first time this has happened. In 1983, we had a very heavy year of painted ladies that they were getting on motors windshield and causing accidents. Uh, there was a, a report indicating that 3 billion butterflies migrated up. And so, again, this is an example like the oak leaf itch mite of insects and mites cycling out. Uh, and, of course, they're all contingent on weather patterns and temperature and things like that. And, again, I just say, you know, just enjoy the wonder of nature. These things, of course, are not going to bite you. They're also an indication of hopefully a healthy environment, too. But, uh, again, this is not a, a new phenomenon, Eric. We've seen this previously. Well, a few more bugs out there. Lace bugs on trees. An update on those. Lace bugs, uh, they have really been uh, feeding on oaks and hackberry more than I've seen in several years. Oak is chlorotic, yellowing, and that's due to lace bug. Many hackberries are suffering. Uh, I think cotoneaster, azaleas are also susceptible. But azaleas, I mean, uh, I would say lace bugs are not a, b- a big problem overall, but this year there's just so many that the damage is extremely evident. And I tell people, if you're concerned, just take a forceful water spray and dislodge them off the plants, yeah. As opposed to any kind of treatment at this late date, for one thing, probably not practical and for control purposes not necessary, it doesn't sound. I I wouldn't believe so, Eric, at this point, yeah, yeah. Because a lot of those plants are going to start losing their leaves anyway. Box elder bugs, and uh, these show up. And the greater worry, you remind us, Raymond, is that they eventually drift inside indoors. They do. Uh, box elder bug uh, adults are, are not going to bite you. They feed on plants, especially the uh, the box elder, Asinogundo. But they themselves, like Asian ladybird beetles and crickets and, and uh, the, um, the elm leaf beetle, start coming to your house. And so the box elder bug will, will start doing that over time. The best thing is to just vacuum them up, put them outside, and try to seal cracks and crevices, which pre- prevents them, uh, from an exclusionary standpoint, from moving into the house. Yeah. But again, they're no threat to landscape material whatsoever? No, not, not really. Uh, not at this point, for sure. But no, they're more of a nuisance factor coming in. There's another relative called the red-shouldered bug which feeds on the seeds of uh, the uh, golden rain tree. We see a lot of those there, and it's the same scenario. You know, they might be abundant coming in, but just simply vacuum them or sweep them out is probably the easiest and best way to deal with them. The last insect issue we'll bring up this week, lawn grubs and treating for those. But you're pointing out that we're rapidly heading into the closing part of the, the treatment season for grubs. 
Yes, Eric. I have been getting a number of calls indicating uh, heavy grub populations in what to treat. And the issue is it's too late to treat with the typical imidacloprid and the materials you would apply in May and June. The only option is to apply Dilox. Uh, Triclofon will work on the larger grubs. And we've seen may beetles and mass shafers out there, uh, late instar larvae. But it doesn't last very long. It lasts three or four. So you're going to have to make multiple applications. The best way to deal with the grubs, of course, is make your, quote, preventative treatment in May and June. So when the eggs are laid and then hatch, those young larvae are very susceptible to the residues of the active ingredient from those materials. Yeah. So it sounds like you're encouraging abstaining from treatment from here forward. Well, we've had some sod farms issues, and they need to do something. So I have recommended a dialogue to the homeowners if they can just keep their lawns healthy and uh, be ready for next year to make those applications in May or June. And that should alleviate problems with, with the grubs, the may beetles, uh, the southern ma- northern mass shafers, we have southern, and even, even as we go east, the Japanese beetle. So, yeah. All right. Raymond, always a pleasure to have you over for a roundup on insects and lawn and garden. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, Eric. Look forward to doing it again. And he is a horticultural entomologist with K-State Research. And extension is Raymond Cloyd, featured on this week's K-State Horticulture segment. With that, this Thursday edition comes to a close. As always, thanks for being along with us. Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.